So, hello everyone, and thank you for joining this, our first uh, saga story. Thank you for taking the time out to register. I know it's not simple, it's, a, it's not a simple task, it takes some efforts, and I really appreciate everyone that took the time to do that, and for everyone that's been sharing uh, the post. Um, I'm really happy to say we had a, a lot of people registering. Uh, hopefully everyone can join the session, if not now, maybe a little bit later. But first, I want to start by telling you who we are, MWE. Uh, we are a platform for women, women, so that women can work together and bring their energy to identify areas of action and empowerment. Uh, we want to change the narrative of Mozambique and contribute to the sustainable development of our country. We aim to increase the number of women in the sector, urban and rural areas, and we want to highlight professional qualities of women in the sector, and we strive to create equal business opportunities for all women. But more than anything, um, we are also working to make sure that everyone has access to energy. So equal access to energy is a huge objective uh, for MWE. Most importantly, um, accessible, reliable, affordable, modern and clean energy. So with that said, I want to thank Antonio Jopella for accepting this invitation uh, to represent the network, the, the energy, <laughs> the women of energy of Mozambique. It's, uh, it's quite, let's say, admirable, uh, especially for a man to be the first one to speak on a platform for women. So um, thank you for that. And I hope you guys can find uh, this, these sessions helpful, uh, at least a place where you can learn a bit more about the, the, the industry, where you can you know, share some ideas and meet other aspiring uh, engineers or entrepreneurs or just people that are interested in general about the, this, this industry in particular. Um, so I'm going to invite Nasi, a fellow mwe -er, a Mozambican woman of energy, to join us and turn her camera on. And Nasi has been uh, fundamental in supporting this, um, this initiative. Uh, she's helped all of us create uh, in terms of the agenda, the speakers, the look, everything. And one of the one of our goals at MWE is to also make sure that people like Nancy, women like Nancy, have uh, a platform where they can make their voices heard and be useful. And she's a true pioneer of that. I am going to turn off my camera and I'll let Nancy do the rest. And I hope this is a the, it's a constructive uh, network. Nancy, your turn. Um, thank you, Tababa. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for attending this first Energy Saga. The aim of this saga is to create a network between all of the engineers and not limited to that. Uh, we want everyone to have access to the information of the oil and gas industry. So for our first uh, speaker, we have Antonio Chapella, who is currently working as an operation and maintenance mechanical engineer in Coral South FLNG project. He served in the same project as a local content officer and also working with the, the works rotating equipment and construction departments of Technip FMC as a mechanical engineer. Antonio holds a master in project management for environmental and engineering and energy, sorry, engineering for MIT in France, and a bachelor in mechanical engineering in UEM. So thank you all of us to join us. And I will say I'm going to turn on the camera. I will turn off mine and uh, enjoy the section. Hi, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining uh, this uh, first episode of the Energize Saga by MWE. It's really a pleasure to be here. We will uh, go through some of the main points of the LNG value chain. And uh, with your permission, let me share my screen. Mm 
So uh, before we start, I will talk a little bit more of what I'm doing now as an operation and maintenance engineer uh, working for this project that it's going, it's going to, to be the first one of LNG in Mozambique. Uh, as an operation and maintenance engineer at this phase that the platform is being constructed, being built in South Korea, we are working on tons of documents, procedures, and schedule to make sure that when the time comes, when the platform comes online, everything is in place for us to perform only the, not only the, the production, but all the necessary procedures uh, from uh, equipment maintenance and keep preservation, see if uh, there is a safe operation see in every uh, modules of the platform if we have a safe the manner of doing the, these things that will be occurring uh, simultaneously. So it's very interesting uh, for me to share a bit of what I learned uh, and to discuss about the LNG value chain. But before that, uh, I will ask you uh, to use this presentation as the base of a very interactive uh, discussion forum where you will make the maximum number of questions that you can. If you don't feel comfortable writing the questions in the chat to everyone, you can write it directly to Nancy in Portuguese or in English as you want. Uh, make the, the, the comments, add information if you want. Feel free, don't, be, uh, don't hesitate to, to add uh, valuable information in the presentation to answer other people's questions. The idea is just to discuss, to learn, to share information and give one more step in this never ending journey of learning. Uh, so please send as many questions as you can, comments, uh, and at the end of the presentation, when your, your mics will be uh, unmuted, you can also uh, add and make questions and discuss so that we can take maximum benefit of this. This is actually the, the true value of this kind of platforms. When you, we use it to share, to learn, to, to teach, and also uh, to meet new people, right? So in this LNG value chain, before we, we, we go into it, we have to understand what is LNG, why do we need it, and what is the process behind it? What is uh, the technology that allows us to get this, uh, this uh, product? And we will also see an example of how it looks in reality. So LNG stands for liquefied natural gas. Natural gas, it's mainly composed by methane. And methane is a very low density, which makes it uh, very hard to storage because it, it occupies large volumes, which are expensive and uh, are not feasible in most of the times. So what we do is to cool it down to minus 162 degrees, allowing it to go from the gaseous form to liquid form. This will reduce its volumes by 600 times, which are used mainly for transportation purposes. And speaking of this, there are many options uh, to, uh, in, uh, to transport gas or LNG. And each one depends on different scenarios where we, we, will, we will see uh, one by one. We can uh, transport gas through pipelines on land. And this uh, solution is mostly used when we want to distribute on a network to the final users, where the 
place where we process the gas and the place where we distribute the end users are quite close. For instance, we can have a plant in Inyambani in Mozambique and have pipelines throughout the country to distrib distribute in each major cities the gas, which is a considerably a short distance. If we have water between uh, the point A and B, for instance, we can have the pipeline underwater. One of the example is if we have a plant in Maputo and we want to uh, transport gas to Katempe, for instance. We can have the pipeline uh, under the, the bay, under the water, and this is also a well-used solution. But there are times where the distance are too long and you have many other barriers. Uh, and one of the limitations of using pipeline, especially across countries, is that they are very uh, subject to political uh, situation. Let's imagine that we wanted to transport gas from Mozambique to Brazil. If you want to do that, and if you look at the map, we will have to, to, to go across the African country crossing Botswana, Zambia, or Angola, right? And then to, from the shore of uh, the west side of uh, Africa, we will have to have a pipeline below the sea throughout crossing the Atlantic Sea. This is roughly 10,000 kilometers. And having a pipeline system of uh, 10,000 kilometers is quite expensive. It's very expensive, it's not feasible. This is when it comes the solution of liquefying gas and transporting using carriers. And this usually is the, 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 the most used uh, transportation uh, method or solution uh, to make sure that the final user, even if he is a crowned, uh, across the, on, on the other side of the, the world, he will be able to, to have it, right? So, in this value chain, we have the exploration and production, liquefaction, LNG transport, storage and regasification, and then the end users. This is mostly what we have. Uh, and there are many variations that uh, I will show later on about the value chain, but it always follows the same path, okay? For instance, normally, uh, in this image, we can see that uh, phase one and two, the, the first two steps of the LNG value chain are onshore, where we have the place where we do the production, the processing and the liquefaction onshore. Sometimes, uh, and most of the times, to be honest, these places where we, we extract the gas, the hydrocarbon, and when we, pro and when we have to process, are quite distant. If we have the reservoir in the middle of the sea, it will be uh, very difficult to have a pipeline or even not uh, economically feasible from the place where we're going to extract the gas or the hydrocarbon to a plant on shore. Therefore, we combine these two uh, steps into one, into a, a floating platform which is called floating LNG, so floating liquefied natural gas, which is subject of another episode that I hope you will be uh, attending. Uh, nevertheless, the chain, the value chain remains the same. That's why we have this. So in this presentation, we will focus more on the step two, liquefaction. We will go through all of the steps a little bit. We spoke uh, briefly about the transportation. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will start from the very beginning because you may ask, okay, we have the gas, we can uh, liquefy it, but where it, the gas comes from? How do we do this? How do we uh, make it uh, liquid? So this starts uh, hundreds of years ago of millions where in sea or on land, we have organic matter uh, which, which dies and was buried over and under many layers of uh, rocks. And, and these different uh, layers, once they accumulate, 
layer by layer of rocks, we have an increase of uh, pressure and temperature. And as it, this goes on, we may, ha may have some uh, tectonic movement, which will create this mountain, mountain shape, so the dome. And these uh, uh, layers have different characteristics. We can have permeable rocks, which allow uh, fluids to pass through it. And we can have uh, rocks that do don't, don't have this pro property. When the impermeable rock is at the top, usually of any or all the other layers, it's called the cap rock. Cap because it, it closes everything below. So with time, this uh, uh, buried organic matter with heat and pressure tr transforms into petroleum, which migrates upwards through the different layers. And the first rock where we have the, the organic matter is called the source rock. Then we have the reservoir rock and the cap rock, which I just mentioned, which allows the hydrocarbons to be trapped into below the, 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 the earth or the, the reservoir. So we end up with three layers. One of gas at the top, which is the lowest density. Then we have oil and water, which is the most dense between these three. And these three, uh, this formation of these three uh, elements remains trapped for millions of years until we, or some human beings, decide to bring freedom to the gas. So we drill it, and this can go to depths over three kilometers. Uh, from the reservoir up to the platform that can be offshore. And another option, we can have a pipeline which goes from the reservoir to the shore, which can take hundreds of kilometers, uh, where we will transport gas in pipelines. So now at this stage, it's important to us to know what is the composition in detail of the... Uh, so the first element, is the um, dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide, right, CO2. Then we have mercury. We have a bit about 4% of butane, 3% of propane, and 6% of ethane. The rest is uh, methane, basically, and many other uh, uh, elements. So now, that we know what is inside. We have some impurities. We have uh, water, a bit of condensates, a bit of uh, even particulates like dirt and so on. We need to, and we, we need to select which process to use uh, to remove all these uh, impurities, keeping in mind that what we want is methane. So at the end, we want uh, the maximum level of purity that we can obtain economically uh, of methane. So we have to remove all the other elements that shown before. The first one are the condensates, which are liquids, liquids of low density, which are co contained in the gas. They usually fall by gravity, and they are the first one to be removed. The particulates, the, the dirty, because we have some sand and, 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 and other impurities that we can find from the process of extracting. The next step is to remove CO2 in the acid gas remover. CO2 goes through a washing tower where we, uh, the gas, the entire gas, sorry, stream goes through the washing tower uh, where the liquids and other impurities are locked down, are locked out or knocked out of the, the mainstream, right? And then after the, the gas is washed, it's, it's, it's forced to go through uh, a CO2 uh, absorption column. And this is used with uh, a packed material of absorber that can be a mine or other absorbers, which are uh, packed and then the gas goes uh, upwards and it's the CO2 gets absorbed by these uh, particles. Here we, in this absorption column, we 
only want to remove uh, CO2 for the first step, but we uh, had to wash it before so that we could remove other fluids. So by washing, we increase the, the level of water and uh, we need to then remove it as, as well as uh, the CO2 because if we leave the CO2 in the mainstream, when we go to the cryogenic part, when we lower the temperature, it will freeze, it will become uh, solid. And this can damage the equipment and uh, create blockage. So this is why we remove CO2. For the same reason, we have then to remove water because the gas was saturated by water during the process of washing. And we do this in the, in the dehydration unit using molecular sieves dryers, which use adsorption to trap the water molecules in, in a column. And so now we, we have a gas without CO2 and which is dry, so without water that we use. During this process, we lower the temperature and we end up with a fluid or about 20 degrees Celsius. The next impurity that we want to remove is mercury. And it's important to remove mercury uh, because it can corrode the material. It's very corrosive and it's not good for the final user to burn uh, a fuel which contains uh, mercury or high levels of mercury. And this we do using another absorption column. So absorption and heat exchange is one of the main, are the main processes in, the, in this type of uh, unit. And in this absorption, you will have the gas passing through a packed material in a, on a vessel, in a vessel which will then remove all the stream. So now we will have a stream containing butane and other products uh, without mercury, which is what is very interesting to us. Now, speaking about uh, heat exchangers, where we have gas going uh, to be cooled, we usually use propane as a refrigerant. And propane is used as a good refrigerant, which is also part of the, the mainstream, but there are others like nitrogen and so on. So in, the, in these uh, heat exchangers, we can have liquid propane on a vessel, uh, where it's cooled to minus 140 degrees, for instance. And then we have the mainstream of gas, the ones that has been extracted, passing through this liquid inside the pipe. So the heat of the mainstream of the gas will, will go uh, to the propane vessel. And the temperature will be lower up to minus 35 degrees Celsius. So we have a cooler gas. We have to then go to the one of the most important stages of the liquefaction part, which is the fractionation. Remember that at the very beginning, the composition, we had uh, propane, ethane, butane, and heavier components. We only want methane. In terms of uh, uh, composition, methane is the, is the less heavy component because it only has one atom of carbon. And then we have ethane with two atoms, propane with three, butane with four, and so on. So all these elements are then removed on a scrubber, where based on the density, we remove the, the, the lightest from the top and the, the heaviest go uh, uh, at the bottom of the vessel. So we remove all these other uh, components remaining only with methane in the mainstream. And all these uh, other products I used can be sub-products. They are not always impurity. For instance, propane is used in the system, in some uh, liquefaction system, as the refrigerant. Butane also can be a refrigerant. Butane is also a product that we use in our kitchen. So there are many sub-products during the liquefaction. And speaking about refrigerants, most of them are 
are used as a refrigerant, what we call a mixed refrigerant, which is used in the heart of the liquefaction, which is the main cryogenic heat exchanger, where we, leave, we will remove the heat of the mainstream up to the point where it becomes liquid. So at this stage, where we have created uh, the mixed refrigerant based on the components that we removed or that we add into the system, we go through the main cryogenic heat exchanger. Here we will have the gas going upwards in a different, uh, in a very long pipe and the refrigerant downwards. When they cross, the heat is transferred from the main gas to the refrigerant. And now we have minus 138 degrees Celsius and it becomes liquid at 900 and at 19 atmospheres. Now we have uh, reached the point where we have liquid minus 138 degrees Celsius. It's about now to cool it further so that we ensure that it will remain liquid and we can transfer from place to place without any issues. And we do this in the flash vessel. And the flash vessel, basically what we do, we reduce the pressure. We were with uh, 19 atmospheres before, now we had 2.5, which means that we expand. And because expansion is the opposite of compression, instead of gaining heat, which is the case of compression, we lose. So from minus 138, we have minus 154 degrees Celsius. So we have the expansion. And we can further expand and further reduce the temperature if we reduce the, pr the pressure uh, to one atmosphere, which is the atm atmospheric pressure. Then we will have the gas at minus 161 degrees Celsius, the, the liquid, sorry. So the LNG in uh, the state that we usually store it and transfer. And this is sent to the storage tank that can have 36,000 tons of capacity and the gas really remains in the liquid form. But there is a phenomenon which usually happens in, the, in this kind of storage which is called uh, evaporation. We have the boil off gas. This boil off gas, uh, it's an important amount of gas which uh, evaporates uh, and uh, it can go up to, in this case of 36,000 uh, tons, can go up to 1,100 tons per day of boil off gas, of gas that uh, uh, went from the liquid stage to the gas you see. And this evaporation process is the same as happened when we are uh, drying our clothes, for instance. If we put um, a wet cloth inside your home for over the night, by the morning it will be dry, or at least it will have lose most of this uh, moisture due to the evaporation process. This happens in the tanks as well. So it's really important to measure the amount of boil of gas. And this gas is usually used to generate power in, the, in this type of uh, facilities. Now that we have uh, the LNG in the, into the storage tanks, we have to transfer it. And we do this uh, using uh, LNG carriers. LNG carriers come from time to time and from the LNG jetty export, we can connect the, the carriage carrier with the tank and then transport all the gas. And because we have liquefied, now instead of 600 ships, we will have only one to carry the same volume if it, if it was in the gaseous form. So it's very important to reduce the volume. And this gas is regasified by heating and sent to the final user where you can cook, have a cup of tea, read during the night and so on. So in a glance, we went from exploration and production to liquefaction, uh, transport, regasification, and went to the final user. In a, uh, that's basically an animation that shows the LNG value chain 
and shows uh, what are the main steps of the liquefaction process. Okay. So in summary, we have gas from the wells, the natural gas, which goes to the slug catcher to remove condensate, uh, sand and other particulates. We go through the acid gas uh, removal, which is where we remove the CO2. Then we remove the water because we had to wash the gas uh, in, doing, in, in the previous unit. We remove the mercury. We break down the mainstream into the different components, staying only with methane, which is the lightest, C1. And uh, we, from the fractionation unit, we can have different uh, uh, products, subproduct, ethane, propane, butane, and others, which can be used uh, in the liquefaction process as a refrigerant, or they can be uh, shipped to a different market. Then the methane is liquefied using the main cryogenic heat exchanges, and uh, it's stored prior to being shipped, prior to offloading. This is a good uh, example of a, a project that we, sh we shown uh, in Australia, where we have two platforms, part of the same project. One is offshore here in the western side of Australia. Uh, and this is a plant where the gas is uh, pre-treated and then sent by a trunk line to a platform onshore, to a onshore facility. And this is a, a good example of the different uh, components of the value chain that are considered, such as transportation, the way we, the technology used, and so on. So let's have a look at this. Uh, let me just share the video with you in a moment, where we can see more details about the, this project, which is quite in interesting and uh, it's worth seeing. So this project is all, was led by Chevron and its partners where we were, uh, they were focusing first in the onshore facility, right? So they have to prepare the, the site, prepare the accommodations, water, roads, and so on, which is mostly what will happen to Mozambique. The modules were fabricated, the LNG modules, they are fabricated in China, uh, also to, to minimize time and to have uh, experience hands on it. The module, the LNG modules then were shipped using barges, cargo barges, which can help uh, transfer. And then for the offshore platform, the modules were done in Korea. So you can have two big modules being done in parallel if you divide. And this offshore module was, uh, was then ship to the site where you have the drilling at once so that it could uh, extract the gas. This top site uh, weights uh, around 36,000 tons. So it's very heavy in structure, which is lifted all in, in, in one time, connected to the subsea where you have the drilling points, and then, uh, and then it's commissioned so that it can start. Here we can see uh, some of the engineers from the drilling campaign finalizing the work, connecting also the, the platform to the, to the subsea, which is also an important step of, the, the, of any hydrocarbon project. And there will be a presentation afterwards which will uh, target the subsea system, which is quite interesting. Uh, for you to attend, where you will be able to understand how the subsea system is designed, what are the equipment such as manifolds, how it's, it is connected and tested uh, to, to the platform. Then uh, once the offshore uh, part was done, they start 
focusing on the onshore part where they build the LNG storage tanks, which are able to contain uh, the huge amount of LNG once it's done. And you can see that there are very big modules measuring uh, uh, 200 meters, weighting around 1,000 or 11,000 tons. Uh, and there is lots of steel, 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 and more steel in this kind of uh, facilities. In this project, the two LNG trains, uh, powered by gas turbine generators and other equipment such as turbines, uh, such as compressor pumps, and so on, were able to produce uh, around 8.9 uh, million of tons uh, per year uranium which is an enormous amount of gas. And the idea of this project was to extract gas with the offshore platform, uh, clean it, remove the condensates, the particulates, the sand, remove uh, the water, and then in gaseous form, um, pump, or in this case, not pump, but uh, with the compressor, send the, the, the gas the onshore facility. Then from, from, from the point that the gas is received, it's just a matter of uh, freezing it, lowering its temperature because most of the, the work was done previously in the offshore plant. So here you can see the, the LNG export jetty where the LNG cargoes usually go. The two LNG trains, which are operational now, and the tanks, the LNG tanks, two to come, two already in place. And uh, with time uh, in the inspection, we can have more trains, we can have more uh, tanks that will be used uh, to, to, to ship the LNG. The project started in 2011 and in 2017, we had the first cargo which is the images here, first LNG cargo from this uh, Whitstone uh, project in Australia, which was uh, an important milestone, uh, making uh, Australia one of the big players in the, in the LNG industry. Uh, so in this kind of project, as shown here, we can have a variety of disciplines working together depending on uh, the project and depending on uh, the type of uh, infrastructure that we are working on. Uh, so as you could see, there were a lot of interfaces uh, in terms of uh, other disciplines. We saw a little bit of drilling at the beginning, which we will have uh, a drilling uh, presentation in the future in, in the in these next episodes. We will have the also reservoir char characterization where you will better understand the different layers, how it, it, is it formed, how it is extracted, the subsea system. There will be another episode as well about that. So I do encourage you to keep following all these episodes, which will complement the LNG value chain. It will show uh, for, for, for sure uh, great value and uh, each time you attend such presentation, you will be able to complement the, the initial knowledge that you have and uh, for sure have fun. So that was it from my side. Thank you for hearing. Let's now uh, see which questions were made. Uh, um, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your time. So, uh, during your presentation, we had, uh, for now, two questions. One from Tomesh Laule, and he would like to know, how can we control the volume of the gas in the reservoir upstream and the volume of the gas downstream? Uh, so how can we show? How can we control? 
monitor. Control. Control. Yes, the volume of the gas in downstream and upstream. Since uh, when you are in the reservoir, the pressure, uh, we have a high pressure and temperature, and we, when we start the process, we have a reduce of pressure or of temperature. So how can we control this uh, volume on the upstream and downstream? Okay. All right, thank you for this interesting question. Uh, Upstream, usually we do uh, focus on controlling the pressure, the pressure uh, on the reservoir. It's during the uh, reservoir appraisal with the survey and other equipment, we can estimate the amount of, of hydrocarbon, can be gas or, or, or even uh, oil. But uh, it's uh, an estimation we cannot, and usually it's hard to have the exact amount, the exact volume. So once throughout the project, once we notice that there is a depletion in the pressure, we can now understand that the volume is decreasing. And there are methods used to uh, increase or to reestablish the pressure so that uh, the hydrocarbon can flow easily to the platform which is injecting water, or if we're producing oil, we can re-inject gas. Uh, and uh, as you saw in the layers, having gas at the top, oil in the middle and water at the bottom, if we inject water, it means that all the, 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 the level, the entire level of these three elements will rise and the pressure of the gas pocket will then increase. Downstream, uh, it's easier because uh, usually the volume is based on the amount of hydrocarbon that you can process, it can be uh, oil or gas. And uh, based on the capacity of your plant, I mentioned this onshore plant was uh, around two uh, millions uh, of um, uh, MTA and this capacity uh, varies from plant to plant. And based on that, uh, we can calculate the flow, uh, the volume flow of the product into the tanks, the storage tanks, and determine how many or the frequency of the LNG or the, the carriers that are necessary to come and to remove the, the hydrocarbon, the product, so that uh, you don't have an overflow of your production. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, the second second question is from Daisy Senda. She would like to know what can be done with the rest of the remover removed components that they if they can be reused for other process in the FLG. And if not, how can they be reused if they is disposed or not? Okay. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, so these byproducts of our liquefaction process are actually quite valuable from the condensate, right? In the markets we use uh, in different uh, uh, plants uh, downstream, right? We can have fabrication even of, uh, of cosmetics based on condensates. Uh, we can also use butane, for instance, which is the gas that we use in our kitchen. It can be uh, uh, sell. We can sell also uh, the propane, which is uh, used in uh, power plants to generate energy. The ethane as well, uh, and many, and most of the sub-products of this uh, liquefaction of the, the natural gas are used uh, they are cleaned, they are process, further processed, or even uh, we can sell it as they are, uh, so that we don't discard anything. And we can also reuse these sub-products, as I mentioned in the presentation. Uh, we can use some of the gases uh, as a refrigerant in the main cryogenic uh, system, where these refrigerants, we can cool them down, for instance, uh, propane, 
and then put them uh, crossing the mainstream, therefore removing the temperature of the mainstream so that the plant can also use its subproducts to sustain itself. Thank you. Um, thank you. The third question is from Agnaldo Neve. He would like to know what is the liquefaction temperature of the natural gas to form an LNG. What, what, what is the, the temperature? Yes. So basically, the, the, the natural gas turns into liquid at minus 138 degrees Celsius. This is the point. But we, we need to go, uh, we need to cool it further to ensure that it will not become gas in case of we have a variation of temperature or pressure. So then from minus uh, 300, uh, minus 138 degrees Celsius, we cool it further down up to uh, minus 161 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure, which is usually what we use to to to, uh, to transfer. Thank you. Uh, from Madalena Gemose, she would like to know uh, what is the value or benefits that the LNG projects have for the nation or country that they are developed for? Very interesting question, Madalena, and very important for the phase that we as a country are going through. Usually these projects bring development in terms, not only in terms of uh, money uh, from selling the product, but as well in terms of uh, giving jobs, bringing jobs to the community in terms of bringing infrastructure where the project is developed because we as 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 shown in the video they have to build the roads they have to build accommodation they have to build the schools and so on and all of these uh, bring at some point the development of different uh, socioeconomic aspects for instance if you have accommodation it means that you have you are bringing people it means that you will have to feed these people there is the necessity, the need of, uh, of the market in place of the economy in, around this project to, to, to develop uh, so that uh, they could serve the project in terms of, for instance, laundering, in terms of uh, transportation, you have a lot of uh, traffic, you'll have a lot of uh, products like uh, cement, like uh, rocks and sand being transferred from one point to another. So it brings a lot of job, a lot of work, a lot of development. You have schools being built, you have uh, uh, hospitals being built to serve this kind of project. So there are a lot of benefits uh, besides the, the, the money that can be made by supporting this type of product. Thank you, Madonna. Uh, we have another question from Clayton. He would like to know if there is a more sustainable way to do the LNG. Sustainable way in, well, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to understand in terms of what. Usually these solutions and this technology are quite optimized in terms of reusing the sub products, avoiding uh, any pollutants to go to the, to the environment. These technologies are well proved. They have a good track record of no leakage to the environment, of no, uh, uh, let's say, pollution, air pollution caused in burning, especially gas, which is one of the cleanest uh, fossil fuels, which, are, we, have, which we have today. So, uh, there are many different technologies to liquefy. For instance, instead of using propane, which is an iodor carbon for, in the liquefaction process, you can use nitrogen, which is quite abundant. You can just cool it down and then use it uh, to, 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 as a refrigerant to cool the mainstream. 
uh, in case you don't want to, to have the risk uh, of using propane as one of your working uh, fluids. Uh, you can use a small and modulated scale, um, let's say modulated solutions of this liquefaction plant so that you can have a more concise with less pressures, less risk, instead of having one big train you can have several trains, small trains, which, which can also make it more sustainable and reduce the risk in case of accident to, to have uh, an environmental pollution. Uh, but uh, up to, uh, as of for now, this technology is quite sustainable. They have uh, considered all the aspects, not only in terms of technology, but in terms also of environmental impact and by, for instance, seeing the offshore platform, uh, we could see that th this platform, once connected, was uh, uh, was preserved in a in a condition where fishing could still go on because the the, the pipes were buried under the sea, and uh, most of the times uh, there is no. They try to minimize the impact in terms of. Uh, people around this kind of platform. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, Katarina would like to know what is the... Sorry. Uh, let's go to Lizette. Lizette would like to know uh, what is going to be done with the rejectors created during this processing. Uh, and what is going to be done to avoid ambiental pollution? So, so sorry, the first part is? Uh, what is going to be done with the rejects created during this process? Okay, so, well, uh, usually, uh, I, I already explained for the main subproducts. Uh, then let's, let's go to the, what is considered waste. Uh, it's mandatory in this kind of project that you have a waste management uh, plan system in place, which can take uh, the solid waste, for instance, and recycle. Uh, solid waste produced uh, during the, the construction, during the operation, also the catering waste, and all the waste that it's produced in this kind of platform have to be managed, have to be uh, removed, sorted out. You have separation of glass, paper, uh, uh, organic matter, and so on. Uh, for instance, the organic matter, meaning food and uh, other 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 things that we we can have in in the in accommodation, are uh, used in in the production of composting, composting which are fertilizer. So there are plants which have a composting uh, unit just beside it where all the organic matter is processed so that we, you can transform the rest of food, the rest of uh, any other organic matter into uh, fertilizer. That is used uh, by the population around the plant to, 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 for agriculture. Uh, for instance, paper, which cannot be used as a fertilizer, can be recycled. Uh, oil, all the oils uh, from the equipment, from the turbines, from the compressor, from the pump have to be collected and then discarded, discarded in appropriated facilities. So the idea is to really uh, minimize. There are, of course, impacts that cannot be avoided. For instance, if you have to uh, to clean an area, to build a facility, you will have to cut down the trees. But usually in this kind of project, there are these compensation uh, plans where for each uh, tree that you cut it during the, the, the construction, you can then replant elsewhere. There are things like uh, when you have an animal habitat, when you have some fauna and flora, you have to then account to a compensation to move all this uh, environment, these plants, this fauna elsewhere uh, before you start doing your operation. So 
this is a way also to compensate the impact that you cannot minimize. You have to, to build it, so you will have to destroy some of the tranquility of the, the place. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, well, then getting back to Katarina, she would like to know what is the most expensive way of transporting gas? So that's a tricky question because it really depends from case to case. And the idea of uh, using uh, uh, LNG is to really minimize this cost. If you use ships to transfer gas from one point to another, you have the cost of, uh, the, to, for, of mobilizing the carriers. You have the cost of the technology to liquefy it instead of just pumping or instead of just compressing and send it uh, through pipeline in gaseous forms to where you want. But uh, as I explained, for long distances, using pipeline is it's it's not economically feasible. You will have to 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 have a lot of authorizations. You will be subject to to to, to political will if your pipeline is crossing countries, for instance. Uh, you can have the risk of sabotage if your pipeline is on, on, on land instead of buried. Therefore, there are a lot of elements to, to analyze before deciding what is the best solution, what is the most economically uh, uh, feasible. And sometimes you may select the, the most expensive one if the others are not feasible. For instance, if you have war with the country beside yours, surely you will not, they will not allow you to have a pipeline crossing this country. Therefore, the only solution is to go around this. If you have uh, uh, problems in terms of, uh, if you have, for instance, uh, technology limitation, let's imagine that you want to transfer by sea uh, or with a pipeline uh, on, uh, under the sea, and you discover that you have a big cliff uh, between this path. Sometimes using the technology to, to overcome this can be more expensive than having an LNG carrier going from port to port. So it's really has to be analyzed from point to point. In this project that I showed, uh, you could see that they decide to have a pre-treatment uh, offshore so that they could uh, compress and send a clean gas to a, to a plant which is 225 kilometers away. They do this because they want to preserve the pipeline. They could pump it, the, remove the, extract the gas directly from the reservoir to the onshore facility. But then the pipeline will be uh, subject to all the condensated particulates uh, and all the elements that can corrode, corrode um, uh, aluminum or steel. So it's less expensive to build an offshore platform, clean the gas, and then send it onshore rather than having direct pipeline. So uh, it's really uh, something that has to be analyzed case by case. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, Bango Lobo would like to know what the advantages of liquefying the natural gas besides the fact that it becomes easier to transport. Okay, very good question. Um, instead, uh, on top of this, you can also have a safest way of, uh, let's say, of storing your energy. Because usually if you do it in the gaseous form, you will have to pressurize your uh, storage tank, right? You will have to, to compress the gas so that you could store the maximum amount of gas that you need, right? Doing this, you will increase the risk. 
you will have the risk of an explosion. For instance, if you have an in, in, in a fire nearby, you can have the risk of uh, having over pressures if the EO system is not uh, correctly in place. But when you have uh, LNG uh, in, in the storage, it's in the atmospheric temperature, which is the, te the, the pressure, I'm so, I'm sorry, atmospheric pressure, which is the pressure that we, we live so the risk is is reduced so it's also a good solution when you want to to mitigate the risk of explosion the risk of oppression and uh, um, and of uh, injuring people thank you um andre kunda would like to know what is the percentage of mozambican engineers involved in the drawings uh, in the project uh, in Mozambique or around the world? Okay, uh, well, the first and most correct answer will be that I don't know. I don't have this number. Uh, although uh, I can say that uh, through local content law and to the most of value of the conduct of most uh, petroleum companies, there is the obligation and there is this good practice of trying to maximize the use of local resources, of local people, of long, young engineers, of engineers which are already on the market in the same country, in order to involve them in the project, share knowledge, share technology, and make sure that uh, the country itself will be able to run the, these platforms by them on themselves uh, in the future. So the design, the people involved in the design really changes uh, from project to project. Uh, I would say in Mozambique, most of the companies that are operating here, the, the oil and, ga and gas companies are employing nationals so they are going to, uh, in universities recruiting people such uh, me nancy and other colleagues that uh, you may know uh, and this is uh, this is the way to to involve the nationals in these projects and it's also a way to share the knowledge uh, to the country that in the future might be uh, operating its own uh, projects. For instance, we have ENH, which are, it is our national oil company that it's learning from these uh, other companies. And in the future, maybe a reservoir or two will be fully managed by, by ENH with the use of Mozambican resources that are involved in these projects. Thank you. Uh, in which kinds of rocks we can find hydrocarbons? So the source rocks are usually uh, named that way because it's the layers where you had the most amount of organic matter uh, buried there. For instance, in land, how do you have these kind of uh, layers? Uh, if you have an earthquake, let's say an earthquake in, uh, in some jungle, right? You have many trees and animals uh, being uh, buried. Let's say you have the opening and closing of earth, the move of tectonic layers. So then all these trees and plants are buried. Okay, under the under earth. With time, these will uh, petrify. So you will have the decomposition of this organic matter on these kind of rocks, right? So we uh, and then layers and after, uh, with time, layers after layers will go over and over this buried mat uh, organic material, which will then become the source rock, and then this rock will. Uh, with time and the increase of temperature will generate uh, petroleum material which will migrate through the permeable layers. So for the 
detailed uh, explanation of the reservoir, the different uh, rocks and uh, the tectonic characteristics. I do invite you to attend the reservoir characterization episode that will come soon. Uh, let's go to the last questions. I will join two that is from Lizette and Vicente. Uh, Vicente wants to know because you, you talk about uh, air pollution or you talk about the pollution. He said, uh, How will you avoid the air pollution? What about the CO2? Uh, LNG is still a fossil energy. And Lizette wants to know uh, what gas. The gases exactly are the employees going to be ex more exposed? Okay, thank you. Really smart questions. Uh, for the first one, the CO2, you notice that one of the first elements that was removed from the mainstream was CO2. All once uh, because it can create blockage, but also to remove the content of CO2, to reduce the content of CO2 in the in the in the stream of gas that will be burned afterwards. So you will have a very low content of CO2 at the end of your product. That then when you burn, it will release a very uh, little contents. But even though you have little uh, amount of uh, CO2, you will have at the end of the burners uh, air uh, treatment system for the exhaustion gas. So all the exhaustion gas in the combustion, uh, whether if it's from the turbines or any power plant, they have to go through uh, air treatment system. So exhaust, gas treatment, which will filter the, the CO2 from the combustion gases and will uh, then remove other materials such as uh, elements such as mercury. We will not remove mercury by 100% in the liquefaction process. So when the time comes to, to burn the, this gas, we will have the exhaust gas treatment to to further filter the, the, the exhaust gas and then have a cleanest air uh, around the, 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 the plant. Uh, and for the second question was regarding the gases that the employees are exposed to in the plants. So as I said, depending on technology, you can have uh, different types of uh, uh, gases being used, for instance, in the liquefaction process. You can have, uh, for instance, propane, which is toxic because it's an hydrocarbon. Uh, uh, you can have nitrogen, which is not toxic, but if you are exposed to large amounts of nitrogen, you, you may die. So, for all confined spaces where you don't have, uh, let's say, ventilation or you have limited ventilation, the employees are, uh, should use breathing apparatus. Uh, and these breathing apparatus are used for a limited amount of time. Usually they have sensors on their clothes. So once you reach, uh, let's say, a level of toxicity in the air that is more than what a, a normal human being can handle, it will trigger an alarm to make you leave. Nevertheless, all plants, they have very, very sophisticated aeration systems where they uh, remove all the toxic gases from the, the working areas. They detect leaks for instance, if you have a leak of methane of the storage tank, they are able to detect, plus also detecting by pressure, because if you have a leak on the tank, it means that the pressure will drop, it will trigger an alarm. If it's not by the pressure alarm, you will have the air uh, analyzer that will extract samples each time, each minute of the, the, the operation to see 
what is the composition of the air to see if the aeration has to be increased or if the employees have to be evacuated from this place. So they can be exposed to many, many uh, toxic gases depending on this platform, uh, on the nature of the platform. But there is the care of using breathing apparatus, of having uh, an, uh, air analyzers and having also uh, a good aeration system. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, I will only would like to say to Marta, Celia, she asked about the removal of assets and the mercury. For this particular part, it's better to go to the saga that will talk about the LNG production, because these products are from the LNG production. Right, Antonio? Exactly. It's a very good uh, point mentioned that these presentations will will complement each other and you have a detailed presentation about the liquefaction process where you will see the technology of each unit and understand what are the the sub products what is the technology what are the requirements and and much more so stay tuned and uh, follow follow mw so before i pass the ball to kalumba uh, I would like to hear from you, Antonio, uh, some advices for the new comers of the industry, what type of background they will need, uh, what you say to them to be part of the, in this industry, how they can be more notable, what they have to do, what kind of books they have to read, and uh, what will you, especially Antonio, different if you knew all of these that you presented to us back then? What would your career would be if you knew all of this? Okay, thank you for this very interesting question. I think uh, the first thing is that the, all of us can do is to um, try to improve our uh, level of English. This is important because this industry uses English as work language. It's an industry around the world. We have many international companies. That's why we made the presentation in English so that you can see that uh, in this kind of environment, you will need to understand, to speak, to make an effort to, to, to be able to speak English to be able to communicate because the idea is not actually to have perfect English. It's to be able to communicate with people in Australia, in Korea, in uh, Zambia, in many other places. You will have a team in our, just by example, in our company, we have almost uh, 50 different nationalities. And you can imagine how many different languages we have. So learning English is my first advice. You can learn by yourself. I did it uh, also with uh, movies, with music, with video games, with talking with my friends and just uh, do it uh, uh, as much as you can. Do it uh, and associate this with your, 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 your time, uh, your hobbies. Um, in your leisure time. Then uh, another point is to uh, be, let's say, attend this kind of presentations like the one we just uh, saw. Because once you uh, start, uh, let's say, compiling different information, once you start observing different information, your mind starts opening and starts understanding the different interfaces between the disciplines in this industry. Uh, it's quite difficult uh, to say that you will learn everything at once. It's not possible and you don't need to. You attend one presentation, you will learn one thing or two or three or many others. And then you go to the other, repeat the same presentation. It's with repetition and compiling bits of information that one day you will become an expert. So be exposed to this kind of uh, presentations, read the materials, read, see videos in the internet about the LNG. You can now 
put LNG uh, value chain in the internet, you will see a lot of videos. You will also find the videos that I sh just showed you. So it will open your mind as you go, as you search for things, as you attend these kind of meetings, as you discuss with experts that will be presenting on in this. Then, uh, well, for the ones who have engineering background, for instance, it's a matter of just selecting what, well, let's say, or which disciplines you do prefer in this uh, industry. Uh, basically, uh, you can work in any, any, in any industry, but uh, if you are interested in the oil and gas, um, you can search on the internet what are the type of positions that are required align with your, your, your course, right? Your, your, your engineering degree. And based on that, you will understand which kind of knowledge it's required from an engineer. So you see, I'm a chemical engineer. You, you saw a lot of processing in this uh, presentation. You will see a lot more in the LNG production. So now you will have to understand, okay, the absorption, the absorption column. You need to understand what is the process behind it. So you learn these things. So when you get recruited, you will be one step ahead and you will be ready to, to learn more and more. Uh, now, in terms of what I could do differently, I, nothing, nothing. I think I'm quite uh, happy with the, let's say, with the things I learned. They are not much, but uh, I think uh, these things take time. You know, you will not, not, uh, you will not become an expert overnight. Uh, but uh, if you are interested, you will learn and learn and make mistakes and learn again from your mistakes and and build up different uh, different things. And networking, networking is also very important. You need to 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 meet people which are involved in this industry. You need to exchange. You need to be around these kind of forums, and uh, they will share and will give you a little uh, a bit of their knowledge and all these pieces over the years you will become you will become quite familiar and an expert thank you very much uh for this opportunity as i said it's uh, it was a great pleasure and it's a great opportunity not only for the for the audience but also for the presenter because one thing is you to know one thing and the other is to be able to transfer this knowledge. So you need to understand it very well to be able to explain to, to other persons. So we have to, to, to thank all of you for your questions, all of you for your time. Thank you and uh, see you soon. <clears throat> okay. Um, I hope you guys uh, found this presentation useful. I know you did. Um, and just to let you know that if you have filled out the form to be um, well, to be part of this uh, a, this event, you will be notified when we have the next one coming up. So you most likely you won't need to do that again. You will just receive a calendar invite. Um, I want to invite everyone to follow us on our LinkedIn page so you can stay connected with the network and take advantage of all of the things that we post on there. Uh, if you would like to have additional information, you want, to, you want to reach out to Antonio or to the network, please do so through the LinkedIn page or the email address that you saw when you filled out the form. Um, yeah, I want to thank Antonio too for you know, making the time to prepare that presentation and <laughs> sitting with us for one hour and a half, taking out time from his job, which he has one. Um, and also Nancy for, for being here and uh, participating, reading through the questions and helping out with everything. It's been really nice to be able to do something like this between us. And I do mean Mozambican, uh, <laughs> Mozambicans between us to organize this, put it all together and have this group of people that joined. It's a really good sign and we do definitely intend to keep doing it. Uh, just a reminder, please follow us on LinkedIn so you can stay connected, so you can get all the information that you need about the network and what we're doing. If you're interested in being part of the network, network as well, please join us on LinkedIn. Just send us a message and we'll get back to you on that. And we'll see you very soon. 
Uh, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the day.